Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Rocket MSP podcast. I'm Steve. I'm your host. And today I am joined by Vince Chrysler from Dark Cubed. Uh, Vince, welcome. Thanks, Steve. Excited to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. I'm excited to have you here, man. Now, I, I gotta say, you know, when I, when I saw your, your logo on your website, let me solo you here. Um, yeah. if you look, he's, he's got the logo on the back and it's got, you know, the, the three up in the, up in the top, it's superscript. Obviously it's cubing the word dark behind him, but it makes me want to go dark, dark, dark. Uh, so I, I like it though. I, I do. I well, like thank it. You. I, I love the logo. I love the font. You, you guys did a, a, a very good job taking what is a complex product and, and just simplifying it with a brand. Yep. That's, that's our whole, that's our whole goal. In fact, the original architecture for our product, and we'll get into this later was this idea of a, of a black box where you can anonymize and share information. Mm. Um, so I was, I was thinking of how do you describe a black box in a cool way? And it's dark cubed. Okay. I like that. So there you go. So before we get into the product, I'm going to talk about you because you're an interesting dude. Um, first of all, we, we want to know who's Vince, right? You, you started this security company. We need to know that you're not just some guy with some money who, who thinks he's going to start a, com you know, computer security consulting company and get rich quick scheme, all that kind of stuff. Tell us a little about your background. Yeah, my background, you know, I've been in technology since before I could drive, grew up in a small town in Southeastern Ohio, um, and, and a, a female entrepreneur in our town that owned the video store, uh, she started the first internet service provider there. And, and, and as a high schooler, I was hired on to be system admin, web design. Um, and so I've just loved computers, technology, security ever since computer science major in college commissioned as an air force officer. Spent six and a half years in the Air Force as a communications officer in, in Germany, went to the Pentagon, and then eventually ended up at the White House. All right. Now, now ended up at the White House. That, that sounds cool. So what did, what yeah. did you do at the White House? So I was, uh, I had an opportunity to serve there as the, the chief information security officer. It was IT security for the unclassified networks of the organization that's formally known as the executive office of the president. Uh, but it's the white house itself and with you doing the uh what did you say the unclassified documents Correct. that yeah, means you didn't get networks. you didn't get to see the documents about the aliens and you know the the conspiracy all the conspiracy theory stuff you just saw actual crazy people messages yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the security for the ufos and alien infrastructure is a different job right <laughs> um, so what was the, the most interesting thing that you saw security based, not like, you know, what the president was wearing or something? You know, I, I came to the white house in, uh, 2007. Um, and this was a really important time for our nation. Um, President Bush at the time actually had launched this initiative called CINCI, the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative. And that was launched because it was finally starting to be realized that, that big, sophisticated nation state actors were targeting our infrastructure. Um, and so to be serving at the White House during that time was fascinating. You know, when I showed up in 2007, there wasn't 24 by seven monitoring of the unclassified network. They didn't have a SOC. I mean, they, they had, you know, a handful of folks that were responsible for protecting it during the day. Uh, the folks that were protecting it, you know, didn't have the highest security clearance. And because of my previous job at the Pentagon, you know, I, I had had a very high security clearance. I was, it was in an organization called the National Military Command Center, which is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Command Center. So I'd been read on at the highest security levels about what was going on with these nation state hacks. And so to show up at the White House and to have the security team not fully aware of what was going on uh, was fascinating. And so it was, it was an incredible team of folks. I still stay in touch with them today. They're, they're just, just brilliant people. Um, but together we were able to build a 24 by seven sock, overhaul the infrastructure and get that stuff moving to protect, you know, what, what I would consider one of the most important institutions in the country. I would agree with that. Yeah. Sorry. And as I far appreciate as, your stance there. 
as far as favorite moments, like I was helping, you know, I, I was, uh, I came in as an air force officer and then stayed as a civilian mm -hmm. and I was non-political. So I got to stay through from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. So, you know, one of nice. my favorite memories was like during the inauguration parade, walking kind of the basement of the white house as the, as the parade and the music was going by and kind of being there at this, like the largest peace, peaceful transfer of power in the world and just kind of being a part of it. It was, it was a pretty meaningful moment. That is pretty, that's, I would say that's powerful for you to, for you to be there behind the scenes and have a role in this. And if you think about it, you, you had the privilege of helping to make that peaceful transition happen. You know, yeah. you weren't, you weren't the guy in the podium or at the lectern or whatever. Right. But right. you were on the back end, making sure that, you know, office a and office B were able to connect, you know, over the network and transfer data and set up, you probably were setting up users and passwords and all that kind of stuff. Like we had an incredible team of, of it support folks and security folks that worked. I mean, by the end there, they were working 16 to 18 hours a day just to make sure that the, the previous administration was leaving the right way. And the new administration was getting on board of the right way. I've never, there's probably one of the most chaotic, hectic and crazy, but also fulfilling experiences of my life to, to support oh, absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. So what was Obama's password? Uh, you know, he used QWERTY123 just because you yeah. know, he had big hands and he could do it all with one hand. Let's, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> so besides that question, what is the most ridiculous thing that you saw when you were at the White House? Um, that, that won't it, get you in trouble for saying it. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, you know, in, in IT security and, and, uh, IT admin, you get all sorts of users doing crazy things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think having a very prominent person in the West wing that, you know, really wanted to listen to this and this was, you know, think 2007. So like streaming stuff, it was not prominent at the point. Um, they really wanted to stream music from this unknown site, right. And so to take this high level political appointee that basically has the director of the president to tell him, I'm sorry, you can't have access to that. Um, and to have like them throw a fit, it's like, okay, you, you know, you're, you're down the hallway from the president. Like you gotta, you gotta behave a little bit differently. So like those sorts of experiences, but, but in general, like the politicals, they were incredible people working, you know, long hours doing, just doing an incredible mission there. So it, did you ever have to tell the president? No, no. <laughs> Did you ever no, even speak with not the my job? Um, you know, I was, uh, in my pre, before I was the sister at the white house, I was a presidential communications officer with a group called the white house communications agency. Mm -hmm. So I was actually on the road with president Bush for about six months. They, you do advance work to all sorts of locations. And so I was with an arm, arm's length of the president a number of times. And when I actually separated from the military, you know, people in that unit get their picture taken with the president. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I got to go into the Oval and, you know, talk with, uh, President Bush, uh, 43 at the time and, um, you know, get our picture taken with him. And he was just a, a, a great, great, funny guy. Um, That's awesome. great personality. It was, it was pretty neat. I love hearing that kind of stuff, man. All right. So let's talk about dark, 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 dark cubed. Um, what, what made you want to start this company? After I left the White House, I went over to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, it was called NPPD, NCSD. Now it's called CISA. So it's the, the uh -huh. group in DHS that does cybersecurity for uh, protecting the federal government and protecting critical infrastructure. I had a chance to work on a number of fascinating programs there. One of the last programs I worked on um, was an information sharing program uh, to say, you know, how do you take classified intelligence from the NSA, give it to DHS, share it with, uh, commercial companies to protect critical infrastructure, right? So how do you protect a dam using TSSCI classified information? And, you know, we built this program, um, and it got announced in an executive order by president Obama back in 2013. 
And, and I came away from that experience being like, this is expensive and complex and hard, and there's gotta be a better way. And so, you know, building on all my previous exper experiences in that time at DHS, I said, you know, what I'm really passionate about is, is how do you deliver kind of automated security analytics, auto automated protection to the mass market in a way that's affordable and easy to use. And, you know, that was the, really the, the foundational and it's, it's, uh, it sounds silly, but it really was like the back of the napkin sketching out this idea of the architecture. You know, I mentioned the black box, um, and the original architecture here was, you know, how do you anonymously, how do you share information that, you know, on a threat to, to tens of thousands of companies and not really reveal sources and methods. And then how do you collect everything that's coming into those networks and anonymize it? So you don't know whose network is seeing what, and if you can have that anonymization kind of minimization on both sides then you can do some automated protection at scale. And we actually got a patent on that architecture uh, in August of last year, um, which was pretty mm. exciting to get my first patent. That's really um, cool. Good for you. Yeah. Thanks. So besides you, are there any other founders with Dark Cubed? So I had co-founded the company back in 2014 um, with a woman, Teresa Payton. We had started a company, Fortalist Solutions, together. Um, so it was a services company. You know, at the time, three young kids in the DC area, you know, you can't just, I wasn't the guy with a bunch of money, as you said at the beginning, <laughs> I wasn't backed by, you know, millions of dollars. And so I had to, you know, had to bootstrap it. Um, and so well, we started, there's this wonderful assumption that comes with you working at the white house that just because you're there, you get to do all of this insider trading, just like everybody in Congress. Of course, of course. You know, just tap into all that email and figure out where all the money's going ahead of time. 100%. All right. So you had so, to bootstrap it. You, you started yep. this company. Yep. And then we spun the two companies apart from each other about three years ago. Um, and so, you know, it's really hard to do a services and a product company at the same time. Um, right. you know, and so to, so we spun the companies apart three years ago and it's been a, a great, great adventure ever since. Good for you. Now. Since you've split the companies, do you have any investors into dark cubes? Yeah, we've, we've raised a, a, a good amount of funds, not a lot. You know, we've been very capital efficient. Um, good you know, the, you. the early days we raised from family and friends, you know, the idea was, you know, we're, we're going to try to raise as little as we can and kind of bootstrap this product and spin it out. Um, and then we've done a, we did a seed round and then kind of a small a round. Um, but we haven't really had a large institutional round yet. So, so ConnectWise or Kaseya don't own you yet? No. Okay. No, and they're, they're, they're trying to snatch up everybody, aren't they? They really are. So figure six months and you'll be, you'll be owned by somebody. <laughs> and hey, more power to you, man. I, 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 for us, it's, you know, the, the, the pure focus is how is mission oriented. Like not, none of my leadership team, I am not motivated by, can I sell this and make money and walk away? Like I'm motivated by the mission of what we're doing. Cause I don't think regardless of what you hear in marketing, most of it's false advertising. Nobody's really passionate about this SMB broad market problem. And that is They're not. in, in really cybersecurity, not. you have a lot of geeks like me who love the really hard security problems. And so we have some really cool, sophisticated, advanced security tools that I'd argue, you know, aren't necessarily helping at the large scale, right? We still end up with a lot of complexity and challenges in the biggest enterprises that are spending a billion dollars a year. But as you go down market, like there aren't good solutions. There are a couple of point solutions that are good in terms of MDR and EDR and that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you want to build a SOC, good luck. It's not going to happen. So where are your developers located? So, you know, a key part of our business, you know, coming from my background at the White House and DHS, we actually work with the Department of Defense uh, as a part of our business. So we're supporting, it's a program called uh, DICE Cubed. DICE is the, is the DOD cybersecurity information sharing environment. If you're a DOD contractor and you get a breach, these are the people that you have to notify that you've, you've had a breach. And so we actually have a program with them where they're funding licenses for free to the members of the defense industrial base. So, you know, if you're a, a cleared defense contractor, meaning you have a facility clearance and you're working with the DOD DICE program, you can get dark cubed for free. 
that relationship comes with requirements, of course. So, you know, our, our developers are, uh, primarily W2 employees. They're all located here. We have a small development team. Um, we're working on a fundraising round in, uh, 2022 to build out that team. We're not a, we don't have a bunch of Ukrainian and Russian <laughs> developers. We don't have a bunch of Indian developers. You know, this is about doing a product and doing it right. So all of your team that are W2s are all U.S. Yep. Nobody in like Israel? Nope. Okay. I just, you know, just a lot of, a lot of countries that people are worried about now. Look, I, I sometimes, I, I try to keep my tinfoil hat in the drawer, but I have, yeah. uh, I definitely have a tinfoil hat. I've seen a lot of things. I've done a lot of work in. Well, you, you know, should have a tinfoil hat. And... You're the, you're the security guy. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and, you know, nation states are, are active in doing things and, you know, vetting people is really hard, you know. Now you keep saying nation states. So when I think of, let's just say Israel, because I just brought them up. I think Israel and I think country. You mm -hmm. think nation state? Is yeah, there I mean, a when difference? I, when I use the term nation state in the security realm, it tends to be, you know, well-funded groups that are doing activities in the cyber domain um, for national purposes, China, Russia, you know. So it's Iran, not necessarily um, like China's military doing this stuff. It's China funding a private organization that it, that could be doing this stuff hypothetically. Yeah. And I think, I think the lines get blurred, right? You know, I've, I've kind of been in a lot of discussions and I think one of the things that informed me the most on the China thing is like in the U S we have this mentality that like, you know, pr uh, in capitalism, like companies can comp compete each other, compete against each other, but you shouldn't steal information. Um, and I think kind of one expert told me, you know, you know, in China, it's not necessarily stealing. It's like taking advantage of an opportunity. And mm -hmm. so like, if that information is available for the taking, why would I not take it? Um, and so like that, it's not, a, it's not a matter of right and wrong. Like we like to think it is, it's a matter of like, what's the, what's the best path to success. And so in that, like, of course, you're going to blend military capability and commercial capability. You know, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of examples, you know, when you're thinking about Huawei and ZTE and, and Tuya in the IOT space that, you know, these are private companies that arguably are doing work on behalf of the nation state. That is something I never really thought of that perspective. I appreciate that. Of course. So how would an MSP, now let's back up. You sell only to MSPs, right? Correct. So IBM calls you up, they say, I want 80,000 licenses of dark cubed. You say, let us find a partner to go after that opportunity with, you know, we're, okay. we're, we're designed, we provide a platform that is easy to use. You know, you can, we don't have hard, we, we don't deploy hardware or software. You mm -hmm. configure a firewall to send us data. We do the automation on the back end. I, I don't like the term SOAR because it has a lot of bad connotation, but you know, we take data, we process data, we let you do automation against it. We let you, let you take actions like blocking and notifications and alerting. Um, and then we deliver that back to the firewall to do blocking. So we're doing the full loop, which a lot of companies don't do, and we're doing it in an automated fashion. And we're designed to be a tool for the MSPs to do that for their customers. Um, we're not designed to support an IBM. Um, an MSP is, and so we'd much rather find a partner that, that has the ability to support that opportunity uh, and can add on other capabilities to it. Okay. So let's say an MSP signs up crazy mm -hmm. idea, right? So MSP signs up and they need tech support. Yep. They, they just reach out to you guys and get some tech support. I don't know how to deploy this software. Can you help me out? Yeah. You know, as a small lean team, you know, our pricing is very aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. and in order to do that, you know, you need to have a lean team. Um, we have, you know, e access to email, like we have an e a support email that we respond very quickly on. We have phone numbers for our folks that, that we can, we give out. 
We have a customer success, had a customer success that's working with our customers. We also have built out a, an extensive knowledge base that our MSPs use. And, and if you go back to our model in the market, you know, you configure a Sonic wall or a Sophos or a Palo, Palo Alto to send data to us. And once it's configured, you don't ever have to do anything else again. You can interact with the data if you want. You can go into our UI and do some other activities, but you, it can be, you know, that, that can be the only step you take. And so what we find with our MSPs is, you know, we get on the call for the first couple of deployments, we walk them through it, we answer any questions they have, and then they're off to the races on their own. Like they don't even, if they want to deploy a new firewall, they don't even have to tell us. And, that, and that's what we've been seeing lately. And, in, in, you know, the last couple of months, the growth has just been incredible. You know, it's just MSPs just rolling it out to their customers. You know, the, the joke is like, you know, one Sunday we had like one, one, one MSP deployed like 10 or 15 firewalls during a football game. We're like, Hey. We can watch football and, you know, protect the SMB. It's great. So. I love hearing that. Yeah. How does your product scale? So, you know, we, we want to deploy it on a, on a couple of firewalls to start, but you know, the, the obvious goal is for any, any MSP is to grow. So yeah. ideally we're going to have hundreds or, or thousands of firewalls that we want to. Yeah be looking after. Yeah. And we have, we have customers that have deployed a lot of firewalls. You know, what, what is unique about us is, you know, we got started really early on in, I think the trendy name for it is like cloud native infrastructure. And so we got started really early on in that, that model where we're, we're built on a Kubernetes platform. The ability to scale that platform out is, is as easy as adding resources and we can do some auto scaling, you know, within, within AWS. So for us, the, the scaling hasn't been an issue. Um, you know, the, the big focus we have is around kind of product enhancement and product development to meet the needs of the market. Like, you know, as you deliver a product that's super simple and easy to use and streamline and people love it, they obviously then come back with, Hey, can you do these 10 other things? And so kind of managing the roadmap and kind of supporting that is, is where we're focused today. Is your product zero knowledge? You know, there are a lot of terms in the market around like zero, zero knowledge, zero trust. You know, I think, I think what we're focused on is your firewall firewalls are seeing all the inbound and outbound traffic associated with networks. And granted, there are, there are clients that are off network and you know, <laughs> we're working on products for that in 2022. Um, but your firewall is seeing all the inbound and outbound connections. There's bad stuff in those inbound and outbound connections, some of which your firewall are, are, is, is seeing and blocking. But firewalls aren't great at doing that, which is why upmarket you see managed socks and security operations center and SIM tools and threat intelligence and all these other expensive complex technologies. Our, our vision is, you know, how do we know the world of what's bad out there? and compare it against what you're seeing on your firewall and be better at anybody else that's saying, this is bad. It has no reason being on your network. Let's stop it and move on, right? Let's, you don't need an analyst to investigate it. We know it's bad. Let's just block it and move on. All right. So let's talk about where your, your Intel comes from. How many thread feeds do you guys have? You know, we advertise over 60 and our, on our sources of intelligence, uh, there's a variety of them. You know, we're looking at things like, uh, forum spam lists and malware command and control lists and botnet lists. We're partnered with other companies like Gr gray noise, Andrew Morris and gray noise. If you haven't heard mm -hmm. of them, they're a great company. Um, so we're, we're bouncing, you know, all the IPs that are being seen on our customer networks against the gray noise API, uh, we're doing things like, uh, you know, there are lists out there of, um, command and control servers that are being posted mm -hmm. on Twitter and Pastebin and GitHub. We're consuming those and ingesting them. So, you know, it's, it's a whole wide variety. We're trying to, you know, cast as wide of a net. And then, then what's unique about us is, you know, if you, if you consume a threat intelligence list, you know, one of the big problems people run into is false positives, right? Mm -hmm. So like you're going to tell me something's bad and I'm going to block it and I'm going to block something that somebody in my business cares about and I'm going to get yelled at and that's a bad thing. 
what we're doing behind the scenes is, is we've built some algorithms based on our experience and knowledge and, and some automation that say, you know, can we classify something as good, neutral, or bad? Can we assign a level of confidence in it and then use that badness and confidence rating to then give you a sliding scale of what you want to block? So, you know, that confidence can be affected by, you know, how many lists has it been reported by? We're going to be more confident. How recently has it been reported? So if it hasn't been reported for six months, it's pretty low confidence. If it was reported like yesterday, that. it's pretty high confidence. I really so like that because we've, yeah. you're, you're right. You know, something you, you, you never truly know uh, un unless it's pretty clear. It, it's, it's hard for you to truly know with, without a shadow of a doubt, this is good or bad. It's probably harder to know it's 100% good, but having Correct. that confidence level, you can say. I mean, I'm 60% sure it's good. Right. And that's probably yep. what you're looking at. You're not looking at, is it bad? You, I would like to think you assume everything's bad and then you start to almost build a case for why isn't it bad? And that's yeah. what helps increase the, the confidence level, right? Yeah. And early on, there were lots of discussions about, you know, what's a force for good? What's a force for bad? Right. What are mm -hmm. the things that push it up and down in those ratings? And how do you build that into an algorithm? Cause again, there's no human in the loop here. You know, we don't have an analyst that's doing this job. And that, I think that's the only way we solve these problems at scale going forward is to say the attackers are using automated means and can switch infrastructure really fast. The only way we can start to defeat them is by doing the same thing to counter them. So ha you've got this really fun claim on your website. With the possible exception of a fully and expertly staffed SOC, no other threat detection option provides dark cubes level of threat insight. Yep. Have any like independent labs done testing to back up your claims? No, I mean, I, one of the things I have a big issue with in the market is the pay to play stuff, right? So, you know, we could pay money and have lots of good reports come out on us. What we rely on is just delivering for our customers. I think, you know, what I've, what I've, what I believe in very strongly from an ethos and, and mission standpoint is kind of telling the truth and being straightforward. And, and, you know, I've built a team that believes the same thing. So if you get on a, a demo or a sales call with our team, nobody's going to say like, we're the only solution. We're the only thing you're ever going to need. Um, but what we, what you will find out and what you'll see experientially is, you know, with a five to 10 minute configuration, you can get kind of better visibility and blocking and protection on a network than you can anywhere else in the market for the, for the price point we're delivering. And that's, it's really cool to see that, that taking off amongst our customers. So where is our data stored? You know, with, with you having these contracts in the U S I assume you need to be able to provide and prove data sovereignty. Yeah. I mean, one of, with the, with this mid market. We don't run into a lot of issues around that, a lot of requirements. What we're, what we're doing as a model is, you know, you're sending a fire hose of data from your firewall and your firewall is not sending us content. Like you're not sending us files. You're not sending us packets. You're sending us the, the metadata associated with the network traffic coming in and out of your network. We're taking that at our, at our edge and we're processing that and stripping away most of the detail there and storing the metadata of that stream. So things like source IP, destination IP, port protocol, data volume, you know, those are the things we're keeping and storing. And, you know, as we, and we're happy, we, we've had a number of customers that kind of want to dig in and we're happy to sign an NDA and show exactly how we're storing and how this all works. Um, but what you find out is like the stuff we're storing is not sensitive. It's not PII. It's not you know, it's not really sensitive data, it's summary data that anybody in the data path between your network and anywhere else could see. And so, you know, by, by minimizing that data and storing it in a secure way, we're providing a pretty good security construct around it. Well, the reason I ask, and, and I agree, I understand because we, what we're doing is we're configuring the firewall to basically send you log information. You're, Correct. you're almost an, an offsite, um, not a sock, but like an offsite collection mm -hmm. software where that's, that's all you're collecting is logs from the firewalls. 
However, yeah, and we're not storing those logs either, right? We're throwing them away once we process them. That's, that's good information to keep in mind. So, and, and forgive me, I should know this stuff better because I, here's, here's my tinfoil hat moment, right? So, you know, Snowden released all that data and then he, he finally had that great conversation with John Oliver on last week tonight where John shows him a pic a picture of his junk and says, here's a picture of my junk. Now explain to me, uh, you know, how each of these programs will, will use this picture. What, what, who can see what, et cetera. And I, I definitely recall there were one or two programs that the government was collecting metadata from, mm -hmm. you know, phone calls or, or internet yep. traffic and, and other things. So if they're collecting that metadata, that tells me that that information is at least useful to someone for some reason. So that is my point for asking about the data sovereignty is, is the data like leaving the U S going into Canada because you're backing it up, uh, on, on S3 or, or Azure and it's, it's going to other countries just because reasons for, for data to disaster recovery stuff. Right. Um, yeah. and then as soon as it crosses that that border, or even if it's a, a digital border, then, then something triggers and somebody else has information, even if it's just the metadata. Yeah. Yeah. So all of our data today is stored in the U S um, it's not overseas and the way we've built our infrastructure, you know, we're starting to pick up some customers in Europe and Australia and Africa and other places, you know, the the front end infrastructure and the back end infrastructure are separate and distinct. And so, you know, we've thought a lot about how do you build a system that, you know, if you're going to deploy the front end in the UK or, you know, Europe for GDPR compliance purposes, um, you know, if, if, if a nation or puts in infrastructure or puts in laws that say data has to stay locally, how do we support that, but also still support this shared, shared security model. So we've thought a lot about it, but today it's all us based. Um, on the, on the metadata, you're absolutely right. And I think that's where we're delivering, you know, some of the most value to our customers today. You know, we had, we had one customer about a month ago that called us and they're one of our larger customers and they had detected a cobalt strike, uh, in, you know, a machine had been, you know, had cobalt strike running on it. And so there's command and control going on inside their network and we didn't pick it up. They're like, look, you guys didn't score this as bad. It scored a six, which is kind of neutral, but potentially bad. And so when we started to dig into it, what we found is like no one else, none of the sources that we were looking at, nobody knew this was a bad IP. So that it was like a brand new, you know, server stood up by an attacker for this attack. Um, and we were about to have a really good discussion with them about kind of how our, you know, why we didn't see it. But what was really cool is we we're able to then put that in our back end and say, Hey, this is bad. And so instantly all of our other customers were protected from that IP. And so the ability to say, I can take this and, and, and protect everybody at mass with one person learning is really a great vision into where we're headed. You know, how do you, how do you provide protection for all without a lot of work? I love and then that. the final thing I'll add is like on the DOD work we're doing, that metadata is a key part of our, our program with them. And all the participants are signing agreements saying they understand what's happening. So this isn't, this is all happening under bright light and sunshine. What the DOD is doing is they have access to that, that, that network traffic for the customers in their program. So we have a standalone environment for this program in AWS GovCloud. Um, and so the DOD analysts are able to like, they're able to look at real-time network traffic for very small and medium-sized defense contractors and search for indicators of compromise without knowing which networks they're looking at because it's all anonymized. So they can say, hey, it looks like this network is compromised. Dark Cube, can you reach out to them and let them know something's going on? We don't know who it is. And that doesn't happen on like my networks, only on the defense contractor networks? Correct. So it's for the people in that program that are using, that are a part of that program, you know, they're signing up to basically say, 
you know, I'm a defense contractor of 15 people and I can send my anonymized network traffic to the DOD. They can look for threats and, and help protect me without me having to reveal who I am. So that anonymization component is really key there. Well, um, assumes the best of people, Steve wishes that you would do that with all of your customers and, and allow the DOD to just like, you know, inspect my network traffic and let me know if I have a breach. Uh, tinfoil hat, Steve says this guy no. worked at the white house and he is helping build a new program. And now they're seeing even more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's why you know i think transparency is key here like truth and advertising really matters um and that and that, that's the only way you you get rid of those fears and nervousness so for us the proof you know we when we bring on new msps it's you know try it free for 30 days if if it does what we said it does then great let's have a relationship if it doesn't walk away and the cool thing is even though the dod isn't looking at my traffic like like thanks the best of, of everyone Steve wants them to all of the insights you're getting from that is still being filtered out to the rest of us. Yeah. And we just brought on, um, kind of the first kind of head of security operations for our team. Um, that's, that's really going to start to do some more insight and digging into the data that we are seeing on the commercial side as well, to start to find trends and patterns and, and you know, where I want to be in the next couple of years is, you know, because you're seeing this traffic and we're storing it anonymized in a single data set, the ability to find beacons or scanning that other people don't know about is, is, is clear and present. And so the ability to start to be more proactive on, on protecting our customers. So you don't need a, you don't need a sock that's looking through a soda straw at one set of data. When you look across a thousand companies, you know, you can see trends and patterns that you can't see otherwise. But a key part of that is, you know, minimizing the data you're collecting and anonymizing it uh, from the analyst point of view. So they're not saying, I, I don't care about Steve's network. I care about the aggregate of networks and what trends and patterns we're seeing. Now, I assume you guys have, you know, DR and redundancy and you test yep. your backups, all of yep. that kind of stuff. Do you, do you have any compliance regulations that you guys are currently meeting, uh, trying to get the audit done, that type of stuff. I, I would anticipate in 2022, we're going to go through like SOC two. Um, we haven't had to do that yet. It's, it's above and beyond, I think with the data we're collecting, you know, when we went through the program with the DOD, you know, <clears throat> if you do work in the DOD and cloud, like you think about things like FedRAMP, um, mm -hmm. but I think what's clear is, you know, we're not collecting PII, we're not collecting confidential and classified information. We're not collecting sensitive procurement data and, and it's coming from commercial companies. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm proud of in terms of the solution that we've built is we're collecting just what we need to provide value. And we're not one of these companies that's saying, how much, how can I collect everything because I might need it later, right? Which gets you into a lot of trouble. It really does. So because you're not collecting, um, PII or medical data or any of that kind of stuff. Will you sign a BAA because it doesn't sound like you need to? Yeah, we've had that discussion a couple of times from MSPs. And once we kind of clear it up, you know, we're happy to sign one. Um, but again, you know, a BAA is really designed for, you know, anybody that might touch PHI, EPHI, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, our team in no way, shape or form will ever touch EPHI. Like your firewall is not going to be sending that data to us. Um, and so, you know, the, the number of times we've had that request and we've kind of talked through what that means, you know, nobody's asked us to sign one. Everybody said, okay, yeah, you're right. You don't need to sign one. I have, I'd have no problem signing one if, if there was a, a case to do so. Sure. So, so what's this thing cost? Um, we, well, we, we sell directly to the MSPs. It's a fixed price. I, I, I you know, we, we don't publicly disclose our pricing. And that's on purpose because of the channel, right? So mm -hmm. our, we sell to MSPs and MSPs resell it to their customers. Um, and some will resell for the, for the price that we're selling. Some will package it as a part of other services. So, you know, when you're selling to the channel, you have to be conscious of, of kind of managing your relationships with the MSP. So we don't publicly disclose pricing, but 
you know, we're happy to talk about pricing to any MSP that, that gets on the call. And it's, it's lower than everybody else out there. I mean, it's because of our model, because of our approach, you know, we enable their businesses and, you know, price is never the issue for us. And with, with MSPs, we're paying per firewall. Correct. It's so, pay as you go. You know, you pay per firewall, you pay usage. So if you have a firewall on for one day, you know, there's, there's a small little charge. So it's just. Oh, so it's almost like AWS where you, you, here's your hourly rate for a, for a server yep. kind of thing. Okay. Yep. And it's super okay. simple. And, and the monthly rate you're saying is not terrible. So, uh, guys, I'm going to make an assumption that it's in the like 30 to $80 per firewall range. I think that's and, a great assumption. And, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And that's, that's a reasonable price. I think, especially when we're, we're just paying for a firewall, we don't have to pay for right. every switch, every access point. Um, yeah. how would you say that you compare? Cause, cause I think people are going to see, oh, we're paying per firewall and they're going to immediately try and say, they must do what Avic does, but you don't cause you're a security company and Avic is not They're right. They're like an RMM tool, but for network devices. Yeah. I mean, Avic is, is giving you great visibility into all the devices on your network and helping you manage those and helping you map it out, you know, for us. You know, you can, you can buy a security suite for your firewall. Um, but I think what you end up, what everybody realizes, you don't get a lot of visibility into what's happening there. You just kind of have to trust your firewall vendor that they're doing what you need to do. Plus, if you're managing, you know, 150 or 200 firewalls for your customers, you know, you have to log in and manage those individual or, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, there's some cloud infrastructures coming out. Even we have a lot of customers using Meraki's, like you can manage a whole Meraki infrastructure through their cloud UI. But how do you know what threats are hitting? How do you know that Meraki is actually stopping them? And so, you know, what our customers are doing, they're combining all these firewalls into a single pane of glass, single UI with dark cubed and automating protection. And then at the end of the month, in addition to doing everything else we're doing, we give you a pretty little report in PDF format that you can give to your customer to say, look at how I'm protecting you. Right. And so, you know, you get to just show proof of value to your customers. Uh, you get to deliver capability. You get to increase your, your revenue. We have. You know, we have some MSPs that are marking this up um, significantly and providing a managed firewall protection service around it. Some that aren't even charging their customers for it because of the price point and just rolling it into every customer. So we give you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you, how you deploy this and manage it. But the bottom line is, you know, we help you detect and block threats across all your customers in a way that you know, takes a matter of minutes to configure and is incredibly affordable. Awesome. Now we're able to do a demo of this thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Before we do, uh, I'm going to do two things. One, I have a final question and that is, is, is there like a, I don't know, like a requirement for you security guys to have the long beard and the long hair and to just look so stinking cool? <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, I stopped. I haven't completely shaven since 2008 when I was at the white house. Like it was during that change of, of uh, administrations that we were working long hours that I stopped shaving. I, I'd been out of the military then for about six months. Um, and I've never looked back. And then of course, COVID, you know, oh, kind of sure. cut loose in COVID. I, I can't blame you for that. All right. Well, um, down in the bottom, you'll see a share button and you can share a whole screen or, or just a window while you do that, I'm going to say this for those of you listening on the podcast. Thanks for listening. I'd love for you to hop onto the YouTube video so that you can come check out the demo of dark cubed. All right, Vince, dark, dark, dark. You ready? Let's do this. Let's do it. So you can see on the screen, the, uh, you know, we call this the main dashboard where you can kind of see, get a quick bird's eye view of what's happening on your network. You know, there's two I love use this kind of stuff. Cause I'm such a nerd. Like <laughs> I just, I just love when it, when it's like pretty, here's a map, here's some threats. Yeah. And the, and the whole idea here is to be able to open this up and say, uh Oh, there you go. Told you guys uh, that apples are more secure. There's an annoying thing with, with the, the Mac, where if you 
put your earbud, it opens up Google or Apple music and you can't turn oh, it yeah. on. So we've designed our UA around two use cases. The first being this idea of fire and forget, like how quickly can you log in, configure a firewall, set up the automation and never log in again. And then the second use case is how do you allow kind of your team to take on the role of a security analyst without having to have all the training and sophistication, right? So if they want to do a little bit of research and investigation. So on the, on the fire and forget side, you know, the question is how quickly can you configure a firewall to work with us? You know, we call firewalls in our, in our, uh, in our system sensors. So I can deploy a sensor here, collect data, um, and give it a name. And with that, you're, cre you've created a firewall. So on the sensor, you're getting a block list, a syslog address and an, an ID. And that syslog address is where you're configuring your firewall to send that data to. Um, so step one is you configure your firewall. Again, we have, um, very clear, uh, instructions built out on, on how to configure every firewall. The second step is then to say, I want to turn on automatic blocking. So I want to enable auto blocking So anything that's an eight or higher. We score all of our threats one through nine, one, two, and three are low, four, five, and six are neutral and seven, eight, and nine are bad with seven being low confidence and nine being high confidence. So this is right in the middle. And if I wanted to do notifications on blocking, I can just turn it on here and put in a slap slack web web hook or an email, you know, that email can be a ticketing system. It can be, you know, there, there are lots of options here. And then if you want to do some other notifications, you can do some pretty cool notifications here. You know, for example, like earlier this year, when the Velexity report came out, you could say, you know, if any of the IPs in that Velexity report show up on this network, then send me an email. Um, and you'll get an email that comes with that title. So it's, it's a way to start to watch for some of these threats that you may be more concerned about without having to have an analyst login. So with those steps of, you know, configuring a firewall, setting up auto blocking and notifications, you're done. You don't have to log in again and you're protected. No way. It's, That's it's it. really that easy. It's that easy. Um. The second piece then goes into, if you want to dig into a little bit more and say, Hey, I want to learn more about what's happening on this network, right? I can dig into any given IP on the, on this, uh, of course doing a live demo. There you go. Um, so like this, this IP is shown up on this network between October 27th and December 9th. Uh, it's hit SSH ports and a few others, and it's coming out of Lithuania. Um, I can jump into other sources and these aren't. These aren't paid sources, but these are links into, you know, publicly available information. So I can say like, what does alien vault OTX say about that IP? You know, here, here we go. And I have access to this because it's public information. Yep. Any, any of our customers can pull this up because, you know, this is just available through alien vault OTX or virus total, you know, eight vendors have flagged this IP as malicious. So what dark cubed has done is we've aggregated those sources. We've said it's a nine, it's known bad, it's bad. Um, you'll see here, it's automatically blocked on that, on that and, uh, we're done. So, you know, with that couple minute configuration, you're protected from those threats. We also give you the ability to interact with the data a little bit more. I call this like an Excel spreadsheet where you can search, sort and filter. So you can say, you know, these are things that have a score of less than seven that, that have been seen in the last 24 hours. Um. So you can kind of say like, this is the one we've seen the most of on this network. <clears throat> now you've got these, these different numbers that you assign and that's kind of your confidence score. So mm -hmm. is the, is the number going from like one to 10 or it's one to nine. So one seven, eight, nine. nine are yeah. Seven, eight, nine are high threat. Of course. <laughs> Seven, yeah, seven, eight, nine are high threat with nine being high threat, high confidence. Um, I think my, uh, internet connection's blipping here on, for some reason or something. Well, the good news is your video and audio stream are working great. <laughs> That's good. So we can, uh, yeah, I think I. This is why I use Safari. 
Yep. You can also, uh, you know, if you want to export this data as a, as a CSV, right. Mm -hmm. We can, we can export that data. Um, so that's, you know, that's a quick run through. We also have, as I mentioned, we have a Meraki integration, so you can add in your API key for Meraki and you can manage, you can sync block lists. Like Meraki devices are funky in the fact that, uh, they can't subscribe to a remote block list. So you have to write block rules via their API. Um, same mm -hmm. with like the Sophos XG and SG devices. And so we've built some custom integrations for those where we can auto block, um, on those devices. So you work with Sophos XG and even the older SG, you'll work with mm -hmm. Meraki. Who else yep. do you work with? Uh, I love Unify. So we've built some integrations with Unify, but we don't support them actively because you, you know, ubiquity has not designed their infrastructure in a way that's really friendly to third parties. And um, it's, they're actually using on the back end of those USGs, they're using Suricata, uh, to do the detection. So when you, when you see the pretty UI with all the block lists, they're, they're using Suricata as an IDS IPS, and then, uh, they're using, uh, syncing block lists from other sources. So like the block lists that they're syncing are really syncing probably once a day. And so what we've built some integrations to, to kind of bootstrap into that, but it's, it's clumsy and hard. Um, so, and, and then their you, their new unify OS is even worse. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> you bite your tongue. So I, in my, in my free time, I am the, uh, it admin for my church and I have unified to play there. Yeah, me too. Uh, I just, so we just bought a building. We, <laughs> we owned a building and then we went mobile because we outgrew the building. We were mobile for five years and now we, we just bought a building and it's yeah. huge. I love it. And I just deployed the dream machine and some unify APs, a couple yeah. switches. I love it, man. But yeah. I wish that I could use some of this type of stuff, um, just, just to help, help me have some peace of mind. So I have it working on mine, but it's not something that I'm comfortable selling to other people because like with the dream machine, you actually have to go in and like modify the boot infrastructure to actually load stuff on boot. And you have to use like this third party thing that's out on GitHub. Oh and boy. I, yeah, it's like, it's not good. Um, it's, so th it's there's no way we didn't forget it in a GUI. No, so. no. So there's no mm. way we, we would support that commercially, but you know, it, it does work. Um, so, so what other firewall vendors do you guys support? Got a lot of Sonic walls and Palo Altos, Meraki, Sophos, PF sense, uh, ASAs. There's, so, there's a lot of PF sense. Yeah. So, well, and the reason I say that is PF sense seems well and good, but that is a system that is, you know, it's open source, you're, you're building it yourself. It doesn't seem like there's much support available for the thing. It shocks me that people are okay to put that into production. You know, as you go down market and you get the really cost conscious companies, you know, people do what they have to do to support them. And, and the, you know, it's, a, it's another great example of like how we're delivering value in the market. You take a PF sense, you know, firewall that may not have a lot of additional functionality. And now you're running all that network traffic through a sophisticated threat intelligence platform and automatically blocking at the back end, right? So you're getting a lot of benefit of a, you know, of a sock of a managed sock without having to, to pay for it or support it out of a basically free firewall in a PF sense. Mm. <laughs> All right. So what would you say, is there, is there a firewall type that works best with dark cubed? Um, the ones we support all work well. Um, okay. you know, we see, a, we see a lot of success with people using sonic walls. Uh, we see a lot of six, I mean, it, the functionality that a firewall needs to be well supported by us is the ability to send clean data out and the ability the, to get instructions back. I guess my, my reason for that question was, you know, maybe, maybe one firewall type sends better data. Like they, they include more information 
in the login that they send out to where maybe you just are able to support them better or, or protect them better just because it's even, even more clear data than the others. Yeah. I'm just making it up as I go, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> some, some are noisier than others, which means, you know, they're sending a lot more, ex a lot of extra data that we don't need. Um, and we just throw that away. So it's, it's our problem, not your problem. Um, and others, you know, we also support NetFlow. So, you know, if, if a device can send NetFlow out, we can consume NetFlow again, that, that ends up being pretty noisy, but we can consume NetFlow and, and parse that just as well as we can syslog. That's incredible. So, so like your demo was two and a half minutes long because it is that stupid, easy to configure. That's it. Uh, the, the product itself, like I'm going to say it doesn't do much, but that's only because you guys are instead of a mile wide and an inch deep, you guys are an inch wide and a mile deep where yeah. you are hyper-focused on collecting log data from firewalls, parsing that data, looking for bad actors and, and just bad stuff that's happening on the network. So that way you can let us know via Slack or an email, the email can go right into, you know, ConnectWise or Autotask. And you just, you just want us to, to feel that warm and fuzzy that our networks, the proper network behind the firewall, not the individual endpoints, if they're out at a Panera, but the network proper is, uh, safe and secure. Good. And, you know, I would say. Not that we don't do much, but we abstract away all that complexity from our customers having to worry about it. Like the ability to transform logs and do the comparison against threat intelligence, do the scoring, do the notification, do the blocking. Like, why do we have to ask a customer to configure all of that when it's all pretty straightforward? And that's what drives me crazy about some of these other platforms. It's like, there's a lot of basic stuff that everybody has to do and the companies make the customers do everything. It's like, we can, we can automate all of that away and deliver value with just a couple of clicks of a button. And that's, you know, if I could sum up where we're headed in the future as a company, it's, you know, how do we expand this philosophy beyond just firewalls, but also thinking about, you know, endpoints and cloud and, um, you know, other related technologies and doing this in a very simple, easy to deploy way. I, I do want to stress the importance of transparency with not just, you know, the DOD thing, you're, you're doing a great job there. That's fine. Yeah. But with how the product works and, and as, as transparent of a way as you can, without also advertising to the bad actors of here's, here's how we do it. But yeah, you know, for, for the MSPs who want to build their own sock, maybe yep. this product isn't for them because you're, you're not collecting logs, you're reviewing them and pitching them in the trash when you're done. Well, if, if you have the expertise on your team to, to build a sock, what I would say is, you know, there are some good technologies out there that are relatively free and low cost. So things like the elk stack, right? You could build out an elk stack with, you know, file beat and log beat to collect logs across your customers and across your infrastructure. What you're not going to get when you build that out is the security analytics piece, right? You can get some cool dashboards in Elk Stack. You can start to think about threat intelligence, but you know, how do you build a sock there? Like that last mile of building a sock is, is expensive and time consuming and hard and requires hiring people that are frankly, really hard to find. And so if yeah. you augment that with what we're doing, right, you can say, I can take this data from dark cubed. I can do the automated blocking and then pivot into elk stack to do the investigation and, and detailed investigation. If I want to, you know, we enable you to build that socket at a much lower okay. price point. So is there anybody that your product is not for? Yeah. I mean, as you go up market and people have built out a sock, you know, I think there's diminished value. Right. Like mm -hmm. if you had, if you had a sock where you've got Splunk deployed and you're spending, you know, you're spending money on threat intelligence or say, you know, we have customers of ours that are using things like perch in the market that, that want us yeah. to integrate into perch. Um, you know, there, there is a demarcation in the market where as companies get larger and have larger budgets, 
you know, they're going to have more sophisticated security stacks and we're not, we're not solving that broad security stack issue. What we're doing is we're saying, you know, at the, at the low end in the mid tier, uh, the ability to monitor, detect, and block threats is, is really hard and expensive. And so we're, we're basically democratizing that for, for the mass market. There's also use cases around, you know, franchises and highly distributed companies where you ha may have a hundred locations, you know, you can't, you can't, but, but it's a low margin business, the ability to instrument those hundred locations, um, and do that in a way that that's affordable and effective is, is, is a lot of value. Would you say that there are any, any MSPs that are too small to need this or bother getting it? Like, yeah, I, I'm only supporting, a you know, six businesses. They, they don't need this stuff. Right. Um. I think it depends on the businesses you're supporting. We're seeing a lot of like small law firms and doctor's offices and car dealerships and all these things start to pop up um, because, you know, they're being targeted. They're having things like ransomware target them. Um, and so the ability to have a little bit better visibility into, into that is key. Um, but I would say, you know, when I'm talking, I, you know, in, in public events and things like what I always say is like the punchline at the end of the joke of cybersecurity is it's, it's about boring old risk management. Um, and so, you know, depending on how you think about risk management for that customer, you may or may not need a tool like dark cubed, you know, if it's, if it's a, if it's a couple of people, you know, on, you know, on laptops that, you know, are only using cloud services and there's no servers, no infrastructure, and you've got a, you know, an MDM tool and an AV, you know, it may not be worth it. Um, but. You know, we've seen a lot of value in the market to, you know, to being able to get the visibility and reporting that we provide and the automated protection we provide. So there's a, there's a big chunk of the market that we support potentially down in the really small space. It's, it may or may not be worth it, depending on what those customers can pay. And then as you go up market, they're going to have again, more sophisticated security stacks. Is there anything else that you think MSPs should know before we wrap up, like maybe questions I didn't ask? that you think are valuable? No, I think, you know, we're just, we're really excited about this year. You know, we early on in our company's history, we were focused on hardware appliances and we were going direct to the mid market. Um, and we learned a lot of, a lot of lessons about the market. We learned, we learned the value of the MSP channel and, and we've really enjoyed getting to know MSPs at some of the shows we've been to this year and the customers that we work with. Um, you know, we really came out of the gate in this model into the face of COVID. And so, you know, we survived the, the COVID year like everybody else did. And then 2021 has just been incredible for us. Um, got to getting to work with a lot of great MSPs. And, you know, again, our, our business model is simple. Our product is easy to use and affordable. Um, our, our sales team, our marketing team all lives in the same philosophy of, you know, tell the truth and do the right thing. And, you know, good things will follow. So you won't hear us making a lot of false claims and, and, and bragging about, you know, things that don't really exist. And so, you know, we're just looking forward to folks trying it out and give us feedback and, you know, hopefully we can work together. And I love that. Vince, thanks so much for coming on here and just chatting with me. I, I had a great time chatting. I, I did. I, I loved hearing about your time at the white house. I, I would love to hear you know, stories that you shouldn't share, but there's probably a reason you shouldn't share them. <laughs> so I won't, I won't ask for that, but I, I would love to have you back. You know, if, if you find a, a nice way for you to protect the endpoints when they're, you know, out at Panera or, or whatever they, the, you know, these people are doing the work from home folks that, yep. that are never going back to the office, I would love to have you back and see another two and a half minute demo on how stupid easy it is for us to protect those endpoints as well as the firewalls. Of course, Steve, this is, this has been great. Had a great time today. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, for those of you that, uh, hung around until the end, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast and stay tuned for upcoming episodes from maybe your next favorite, favorite vendor. Thank you. Take care.